Hello there guys, it's Joey, and today's video is going to be talking about the Norns from the Nordic tradition uh, within a pagan pantheon, if you like. And I was requested to create a specific spell set around the Norns, and I will show bits and pieces of that throughout this video as we discuss it, and talk a little bit about some of the myth and some of the lore, and then sort of what it was like to engage for the first time with these energies, which previously I had not um, sought out personally. And then at the very end we'll have a close-up again of the products, just so that the lady who requested them can see them. But the rest of this video we're going to talk about kind of the informational side of things, what it was like to actually sort of embrace these energies, and working with these energies for the first time. It was a very interesting experience. And there's some really interesting tidbits that I thought were really unique to this particular energy. And it really brought some quite large questions into the forefront uh, that I think really sort of resonate with us around this time of full moon, particularly with this Virgo um, Pisces mesh going on where you've kind of got like the uh, the head and the heart are kind of pulling and tugging at either side of us and uh, making us decide which is most important. So the three Norns with a capital N are, now I'm hoping I'm pronouncing this right, Urd or Yurd maybe, um, whose name means what once was, Vedandi, what is coming into being, and Skuld, that which should be. They were all frost giantesses, rather than goddesses originally, uh, that lived at the well of Urd, beneath the roots of Yudrasil, the world tree. They kept two white swans and used to travel as swans to tell mortals of the future and advise them. They used to carve fates on staves of wood, possibly also meaning the world tree. They correspond to past, present, and necessity in a cyclic conception of a time. The Norse model of destiny is more dynamic and volatile than the unalterable Greek concept of fate, because the uh, Norns often get uh, compared to the Greek fates, leaving ample room for individual agency in the shaping of destiny, for while there may be only three main norns with a capital N, there are countless lowercase norns, an old Norse word for generic practitioner of magic. And I'm gonna, I might read that again because I think it's, it's such an interesting uh, piece of information. So they don't respond to past, present and future as in the future is set. Um, in the Greek mythos, the future is very much set and there is no room for alteration. But here the three norns represent past, present and necessity. So this Norse model is uh, volatile and dynamic. It means that individual agency in the shaping of destiny can affect our lives. And that really is interesting that the norns with a little n is very much like magicians. They have the, the ability to alter their fate. Um, they have this, the power to shape a destiny and, and take what is already and really alter that. And it gives a really interesting perspective into the uh, Norse pantheon, paganism, uh, path, if you like, that it's not about fate is set by the Norns and it cannot be altered, but rather there is a personal responsibility. There is what was and what is and this is shaped, but the future isn't completely set. And I've got some of the uh, poetry here from where Norns are mentioned. Now the problem with, I think, a, a lot of this is that sometimes the information given on Norns is kind of used interchangeably from um, between the two, between um, Norns with a capital N being Yud, Verdandi and Skuld. Skuld? Um, and the lesser norns. 
Sometimes there is no clear distinction between Norns, Freljas, Hamajas and Valkyries. Um, meaning the poetry is a little bit more difficult. But the poem, the poetic Edda and the prose Edda are the two that are mentioned. Tell me then, Fafner, for wise art famed, and much thou knowest now, who are the Norns who are helpful in need, and from the babe the mother bring? Fafner spake, of many births the Norns must be, nor one in race they were, some to gods, others to elves are kin, and Devalin's daughters some. It appears from the Voluspa, Voluspa, I have no idea how I'm badly I'm pronouncing it, that the three main norns were not originally goddesses but giantesses, Shutums. Um, in their Voluspa relates that three giantesses of huge might are reported to have arrived to the gods from Jutenheim. I know how to say Jutenheim. <laughs> It's too much marvel. Um, in their dwellings at peace they played at tables of gold no lack did the gods then know, till thither came up giant maids three, huge of might out of Jotunheim. The Vol Voluspa, I'm probably Jotunheim, so is that Rulinspa? Vuluspan uh, contains the th names of the three main norns, referring to them as maidens. Thence come the maidens, mighty in wisdom, three from the dwelling, down neath the tree. Earth is one named for Thandi the next. On the wood they scored and schooled the third. Laws they made there and allotted to the sons of men and set their fates. That may be one of the only ones with the three main norns named of the poetry. I think it may well be. But uh, many of the others uh, speak interchangeably about um, blaming malevolent norns um, for their situation. But that tends to, in my interpretation of, of what is going on, be the Norns with little n, not the capital N. So the little Norns, if you like, the little Norns are people who have um, created magical spells and things and that has afflicted somebody in a negative way or afflicted their fate in a, in a negative way um, and then they bear ill will towards them. No an ash standing called Yodosil, a high tree sprinkled with snow white clay. Thence come the dews in the dale that fall, it stands evergreen above it as well. And it is said that the three norns who dwell at the well of Udur take the water of the well and uh, sprinkle it over the ash, so its limbs shall not wither nor rot. The water is so holy that all things that come into their well as become as white as the film which lies within the eggshell. There is a lot of uh, possibility within um, the Nordic texts that we have accessible to us and I am not fluent in the Nordic text. I have read some time ago most of the Nordic mythology. I find it very interesting. I find perhaps some of the most interesting mythos there is to read from a structural academic perspective. I think it's really quite interesting. And I was having a look at some of the different 
experiences of people online who had worked with the Nords and some were saying you know that a lot of this um, isn't kind of covering who the main Nords are and there's very little specific information with regards to their influence and, and their role. There is uh, this depiction of what their names mean, there is some um, physical elements given to them, so uh, Vedandi is given as being young and active, looking straight before her, um, Erd is given as looking old, decrepit and looking backwards, and Skuld is veiled with an unopened scroll. And then there's this element of um, scratching fate onto wood, which kind of has a runic feel to it, um, the attachment to the world tree, and um, then again, this really interesting concept of cyclic time, um, and this agency of having to be able, sorry, being able to influence and affect one's fate. So a lot of the work that I was finding kind of compared the Greek fates to um, the Nordic Norns and saying they're the same thing, but I really didn't feel that because it really resonated with me, this idea that the Greek mythos of fates was very set. It was a middle, a beginning, and a cut, and an end, and there was no interfering with it. It was just a man or woman's fate, and that was how it would be. However, here, with this introduction of these magicians, these little norns, of having an element of choice, of, of, of seeking one's own destiny. And I found that really, really interesting and a really interesting thread to go down with regards to engaging with the energy of norns from whom previously I had not had any experience. And in the creation of physical items um, for somebody who had requested it's really quite important to get a feel for the personality, the energy of these Norns, these giantesses. And initially I had a very specific thought about where I wanted the colour scheme to go, for example, and it didn't happen that way. There was this element of gently moving things behind the scenes until it was as it wanted to be. And uh, initially I was going to have them all all shades of a particular colour and then that ended up not being exactly what happened. Um, I wanted them all to reflect one another but to be different. So there was a tie, a thread of fate weaving into these energies that presented themselves. There was a insistence upon how they presented themselves and I think there's this element of these frost giantesses becoming very, very important figures within uh, the Nordic pantheon, with the Nordic gods, and they're near the world tree, they're near Yggdrasil. Um, the most, perhaps, important linchpin, the middle bit, the most, perhaps, important part of spirituality within the Nordic path, the world tree that connects all realms. and they are there tending this, tending Yggdrasil and handing out fate to man and god alike and they are frost giantesses. They are not gods, if you like. Uh, is it Vanir? Is that the correct way of... I may be, that might be wrong. Um, I think it's Vanir. It's gonna bug me now. It's completely gone out of my head. But the fact that they're out of, technically they're out of their element, they, they are fish out of water, if you like, that they are perhaps the natural enemy uh, of the gods, but there they are, handing out fate to god and men alike, and they cannot be questioned. Excuse me, it's too warm today. Um, and it's just this fascinating, tremendous, mysterious power. And I was reading about how somebody who was engaging them on a ritualistic spiritual level said, you know, there's not a lot of information pertaining specifically to these three Norns, uh, Urd, Verdandi, and Skuld, um, although in the, that it was with a T. So whether or not it's Urd, Verdandi, and Skuld, I'm not sure. But um, again, I'm not sure on the pronunciations. It's, it's not my main pantheon of, of interest. And it's so interesting to me when you start to engage with energies of mysterious beings, mysterious, n not gods, but 
these giantesses from legend who've become spiritual beacons of great power, of great importance. And yet there's this very strong energy of being behind the scenes, of allowing these things to flow into being, of allowing what is always meant to have um, been to come to fruition and reminding us to be present, to be aware, but also that we can still influence and affect our lives going forward with decisions. And each of the three kind of has a realm of influence, a sphere of influence. And for me, uh, for example, we'll start with Erd and um, yeah. So this is uh, the the uh, votive for Erd, and this is the. There are two of those for the lady who's is, and this is the pillar for Erd. And then we have the oil. And she is what once was. Um, a fate of what once was is pretty much the most set. That that has already come to pass that cannot be changed. However, there is this idea of this cyclic nature of time. And does that, in our minds, mean that the past is set? Or is it cyclic? Are we looking at time through our narrow scope? Are we, as spiritual beings, if we sort of were outside of our shells, would we be able to tra move around in time a little bit more freely, experience things in a different perception? Is our linear idea of time basic and not true? Is, is it possible that in all the great cosmos that we don't sort of uh, experience this life and go forward in time, that perhaps our next life could be what we perceive as being back in time. And it brings up these really interesting thoughts that we can never know, because the past, for a linear sense, is what once was, and meant much of it for forgotten. We forget elements of our past, so we don't overload our emotional selves. I was reading about it this morning, it's interesting, synchronistic, that it came up in my feed this morning, I was reading about it, that we often forget elements of our past because too much would be sensory overload. So is that also true for um, the great cycles of life? Is that a lesson of Earth that um, we don't really know what the past is because we forget elements of it, we paint over it, we get rose tinted glasses about it, we take what we want from it, we try and remember elements but we don't remember everything and perhaps we remember sights and sounds and feelings and smells but we don't remember certain details and it all becomes hazy and mysterious and not quite how it was because we view it through the lens of how we perceive, how we remember. And within a cyclic nature of time, um, it sort of throws off where the past actually is. It kind of challenges our very perception of what past tense is. And we as human beings seem to desperately cling to structure and perhaps it's kind of uh, a little bit too focused on sort of trying to create order out of chaos. Perhaps this is a lesson of it. And the energies of those particular items tend to reflect that. Um, there is an element of don't forget, remember, uh, remember where you've been, remember all your lessons, don't be forced to relive the past comes through into its messages as well. Take parts of who you were, take parts of your past and bring them into the cycles of the now. So then we have Vadandi, or Vathandi. What is coming into being? Young and active and, and looking straight ahead. Um, and her bits and pieces are as follows. So there is a votive. And I'm actually going to show you the difference in colour in a second between the two. Um, and then her pillar, and then her oil. So, they are quite similar. 
Um, and they originally, I was thought they were all three going to be shades of one another, which I kind of like the idea of. Um, and then Skull just flat out refused, which is the whole, this is the experience with the whole of them. So you can hopefully see that uh, Erd is a good deal deeper, darker, um, because the past is further away and it's deeper and it's darker, and this is more in the light of the now for, for Thandi. Now originally I wanted them all to be shades of grey, um, and then came out, inexplicably the first one came out very grey-green, and I was sat there like, okay this is, this is not, this shouldn't have happened, how did this happen? And I got this very strong feeling of the, because they're so connected to this well, and as well as Yudrasil, that the green was a reflection of the waters of the well, and the connection to Yudrasil and, and earth, and there had to be this earthy connection. This it almost looks lagoony, watery as well, so it kind of fits there, and then it has a kind of sky element to it as well. So they were very, very vocal in how they wanted to be perceived in a colour formation and it's, the three have a similar thread going through I managed to keep a thread going through, thank goodness because <laughs> I was like, I want them I want you to be able to see the threads of fate moving through all three I want them to be interconnected so, uh, for for Dandy, what is coming into being um, it kind of speaks to the present it speaks to being present and it speaks to um, the nature of who we are as individuals and being aware of what we're doing right now. Looking straight ahead, being and perceiving and uh, being of the moment and not always looking behind and not always looking in front but rather living. And I think Vedandi has a much more impish feel to her than the other two. She's a much more of a, a a joy of a life, of a life force, of a vibrance, of a grabbing life um, by the horns. That's not what went through my head, but I'm, <laughs> I can't say that on video. Grabbing life by the horns and really uh, knocking it down, riding, riding it, being honourable, um, fighting for what is glorious in a, a very uh, Nordic perspective and being very, very aware of the world around us and, and going into battle and not being head off somewhere else in order to protect oneself, in order to fight one's battles, in order to be the glorious self that one can be. And there is an element of uh, of glory in for, for Dandy's coming into being, seeing what is coming into being, knowing that it's right and how things should be. and. Uh, it's very much a life force energy of uh, taking a good stock and taking pride in the energies that came forth from the dandy. And then there is uh, Schooled. Now, I'm not playing favourites, but um, her imagery came through much, much clearer. Uh, that which should be, and she's veiled, and uh, you can't see her, and I. However, I got the clearest visual um, on, a, on a meditational level with uh, Scald. So this is her pillar. You can see there is green still there, but we've gone all out grey. And uh, the votive. There are two again. There are two for each as requested. And then her oil. And we'll talk about the smudge in a minute. So for Scald. She is what should be, that which should be, closely veiled and looks opposite Urd with uh, her veil over her face and an unopened scroll. And there is just this mystery. Mystery and mist, as it happens. There was a lot of mist in the visual I got from Scold. And this unknowable energy. This it's not deathly, not quite. Um, it's not like the death element in the same way that perhaps the Greek fates were. Um, it's just perhaps the vast emptiness ahead and the human need to make sense of that which is unknowable and unknown. And the fact that the small norns exist show that there is that element of 
control that can be sought um, to shape one's destiny, to seek magic and um, weave one's fate going forward. And it's never um, without an ability or within, it's never outside of your own ability to shape yourself and your destiny going forward. Um, it's fluid, it's not uh, set in stone, it's something that you can affect and influence. And I love that. I love that there is a huge chasm, a huge sort of element of, oh my goodness, that you, that you could fear if you uh, uh, were verging on the edge of that. And many of us do fear um, not knowing where we're going and what we're doing. The unknowable is perhaps what frightens men and women the most uncertainty and Skull kind of presides over that and uh, sort of gives hope to that in, as far as um, my understanding was. There was an element of, uh, to all of them, of being apart a little bit from um, humanity but also of wanting to assist humanity. There is these stories of them travelling to um, advise humans in swan form and I thought that was really telling that perhaps they were a little bit more hands-off, but they weren't without empathy. Um, they weren't above giving advice and, and, and speaking to humans in order to help humans. And perhaps the very reason of them being there was to create a connection between gods and man. Um, and that's why they were perhaps the outsiders. And that energy comes into how we would work with it, that perhaps the norns can be used as a connection between gods and us as human beings and receiving spiritual messages in these three uh, very specific realms of destiny and magic and being. And for that um, also here is um, the smudge. You'll have to probably get a closer look. It smells so good. Oh it smells so good. Um, closer look at the end on the video when I zoom in and have a look at all the goodies um, for the lady who requested them. And uh, the idea of creating this temple was very much about creating the base of Yudrasil for me, um, for the well of the Yud. And um, it very much being about a creating a place of worship where that holy tree, that connectivity, was a place of power. And all those magical threads that connected not only the fates of mankind and gods, but the fates of the worlds and the fates and the branches of the tree coming together and they're all being um, connected within Yudrasil and within that well of Yud which sustains that tree, that in interconnectivity between water and earth and destiny and fate of what could be and what shall be, um, what can be shaped, what can be changed and what once was but it's cyclic so they all flow into one another and what is right now and what can be perceived and what can be changed and what can be altered and what can be heeded in terms of messages from the divine, from um, Yudrasil itself, from the interconnectivity of earth into our spiritual practice. And it had a very, very strong energy of that to it, of uh, bringing forth elements of we are witches and we are connected to the earth and we are connected to the physical realms of what we can see and feel and taste and touch. It's not just astral, it's not just ether, it's not just spiritual, but it's all of these things in conjunction. All these tree branches coming down through Yudrasil and the roots that go into the ground and the leaves as well, but it's all one great big tapestry, one great big ecosystem of spirituality. It's not simply um, a removed spirituality, a removed spirituality at all. It is about experiencing it and seeing it and feeling it and seeking and learning and growing. There is an element of growth here with the norms, absolutely, of you can take on these lessons if you will. You can listen to this advice if you will, and you can grow and adapt if you will. So that's it for this video. Many blessings. Okie doke, so I said at the end of the video we would have a little bit of a closer look at uh, all the elements here. So we have the smudge. Oh, pretty. Very Yodrasil, very tree energy, very uh, connection between earth and water and destiny and fate and interweaving energies. I love it. And then over here we have uh, the energies for Skuld. And uh, just give 
her oil a little shake and it can show you the top of the pillar. So that's her oil. And uh, come on. There we go. And then we have the dandy. And we have her oil. Again, a familiar vein running through all three. And then her OTs. And then we have Urid over here, the two votives, and uh, let's shake her oil up so I can see. And then her pillar. Okay. So I hope you like it. Let me just zoom out so you can see just about everything. You can't see the top of the pillars from here, but there you go. And many blessings.